Hello, and welcome to another short box from Warhammer 40K's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar, and this week we'll be discussing an important person, the Horus Heresy. This week we'll be talking about Nathaniel Garo, previously commander of the 7th Company of the Death Guards, and eventually became the Agenta Primus of the Knights Errant. <clears throat> like so many of the Astartes of the Traitor Legions, who remained loyal to the Emperor at the start of the Horus Heresy, Nathaniel Garo was born on Terra, in the small techno-barbarian state of Albia, on the continent of Europa. Garo was one of the few remaining Terran Astartes of the 14th Legion, when it had still been named the Dusk Raiders, so known because of their signature tactic of attacking a foe at nightfall. Garo had joined the 14th Legion before anyone had even known the name of Barbarus, the future homeworld of Mortarian and the Death Guard. In those earlier years of the Great Crusade, the 14th Legion had no Primarch but the Emperor himself. Garo had been there as the Emperor crossed the galaxy in search of his lost sons, until he came to Barbarus and discovered the gaunt warrior foundling named Mortarian, who led its oppressed people. At long last, the Emperor had found the Primarch of the 14th Legion. On the day of Mortarian's coronation as Primarch, a good majority of the 14th Legion had been of Garo's stock, warriors born on Terra or within the confines of the Soul System. But slowly that number had dwindled. And as new recruits joined the Death Guard's fold, they came from only Barbarous. By the last days of the Great Crusade in the early 31st millennium, only a comparative handful of Terrans remained in the Legion. In his darkest moments, Garrow imagined a time when there would be none of his kinsmen left amongst the 14th. And with their deaths, the traditions of the old Dusk Raiders would finally fade away. He feared that moment, for when it came to pass, he knew that something of the Legion's noble character would die as well. His refusal to relinquish these old Terran traditions and high-handed leadership caused a rift between himself and some of the barbarous-born captains of the Legion, who often referred to the staunch and reserved battle captain as Straight Arrow Garo. Garo further compounded this rift by his refusal to recognize the growing fraternity of warrior lodges within the Legions, despite being offered membership on multiple occasions. Yet while in his own Legion he found resentment for his stoicism, such as First Captain Callus Typhus and Ignatius Grolgor, Captain of the Second, he had gained a few friendships from the Astartes of other legions, such as the lad we discussed last week, Captain Garviel Loken. Yet, he became as close as a brother with Captain Saul Tarvitz of the Emperor's Children. There were few individuals outside of the Death Guard that Garo would ever have given the distinction of being called brother, but Tarvitz was one of them. Tarvitz had earned Garo's friendship during the Preexor, campaign and proven to him that for all the reputation of Fulgrim's Astartes as overconfident peacocks, there were warriors amongst the ranks of the Emperor's children that embodied the ideals of the Imperium. In recognition of their bond, the two Astartes made a small eagle carved into their power armor ceramite by knife point, a sign of the battle debt they owed one another. When they clasped each other's wrists, their van braces would form the sign of the Imperial Aquila. Now, as I mentioned before, Nathaniel Garo had very few supporters amongst the command structure of the Death Guard, yet he had one very powerful ally in the group, and that would be Mortarian himself. We see this in particular after the Jorgal persecution. He was singled out by his Primarch Mortarian, who offered Garo the rare opportunity to share a celebratory drink with him. It was said that there was no toxin too strong, no poison so powerful, and no contagion of such lethality that a Death Guard could not resist it the Death Guard were known to harden themselves through stringent training regimens as neophyte Astartes, willingly exposing themselves to chemical agents, contaminations, deadly viral strains, and venoms of a thousand different shades. They could resist them all. From a set of bowls was mixed and poured dark liquids into a pair of ornate goblets. The senses of the chosen Astartes often rebelled against the odor of the toxins. Their implanted neuroglotus and preminor organs rebelling at the mere smell of the poisonous brew, but to refuse the cup would be seen as weakness. The poor distillate often contained a potent mixture of Agent Magenta Nerve Bane, some variety of sword beetle venom, and other less identical compounds. The cups were Mortarians, and in each battle after the Death Lord took the field in person, he would select a warrior in the aftermath and share with that man a draught of poison. They would drink and they would live, cementing the unbreakable strength of the legion they embodied. Now, Mortarian knew Garo frowned upon such traditions as the cups, but he explained to him that honors and citations were sometimes necessary. Warriors must know that they are valued. 
Praise from one's peers must be given when the moment is right. Without it, even the most steadfast warrior will eventually feel unvalued. Mortarian talked to Gara privately after their drink, trying to gauge the battle captain and figure out where his loyalties truly lay. The Primarch wanted to ensure that Gara would be loyal to him, and the cause of the traitors when the Warmaster Horus launched his campaign to usurp the Emperor and topple the corrupt Imperium. Mortarian also wanted to know why the battle captain eschewed membership in the Warrior Lodge that had been established within their legion, a custom that had spread from the Luna Wolves to many of the other Astartes formations. Garo felt that as Astartes, they had been set on a path by the Master of Mankind, tasked to regather the lost fragments of humanity into the fold of the Imperium, to illuminate the lost, castigate the fallen, and the invader. They could only do so if they possessed truth on their side. Garo felt that these lodges, though they had their worth, were ultimately predicated upon secrecy and the act of concealment, and he would take no part in it. Though disappointed by Garo's point of view, Mortarian still hoped to turn Gar to the traitor's cause. He appointed the battle captain as his equerry, taking him to an important conclave aboard the Warmaster's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, to discuss the upcoming campaign and the Esfon system. The Primarch still hoped to sway Garo's loyalty towards the Warmaster's cause, a cause now his own. Now, what comes next is what we will be discussing next week, the culling of Esfon III. So we're going to skip ahead a ways. Now, what happens after S. von III and the flight of the Eisenstein parallels much of what happened to Garviel Loken and the Knights Errant, as Nathaniel was named Agentia Primus of the group. More interesting to me is his dealings in between missions for Rogaldorn and Malkador as a Knights Errant, when he began his search for Euphrates Keeler, a remembrancer he had saved from the vengeful spirit from S. von III. Now, Euphrates Keeler is important to the Imperium of Man because she would go down in history as the very first saint of the Imperial cult. Yet, after the flight of the Eisenstein, she disappeared, and Garo spent much of his time trying to find her. Now, while searching for Keeler on Terra's Riga orbital plate, Garo met Catonia Tallery, a scribe of the Imperial administration, who in the course of her work had discovered that starships and other crucial strategic supplies were being secretly siphoned away from other projects to prepare Terra's defenses and covertly delivered to Titan, the moon of Saturn, under the operational codename of Atheris. Tallery feared that the mysterious shipments were part of a plot by the traitors embedded in the bureaucracy of the Departmento Minotaurium to somehow aid Horus's cause in advance of the coming siege of Terra. Goro believed her suspicions to be true, due to her utter devotion to the god-emperor and his growing cult. Together, the scribe and Garo boarded a derelict starship intended to be used as raw material to build as a new fortress monastery on Titan. They managed to make their way to various construction sites on the large moon where they discovered that strange, psychic best weaponry was being shipped to the site. Determined to discover the truth behind what was happening on Titan, the pair fought their way through the security forces present to the very top of the newborn fortress monastery, where to their shock, they discovered Malkador the Sigilite already there waiting for them. The region of Terra revealed that what was happening on Titan was not part of a conspiracy by the traitors, but the culmination of a new secret project authorized by the Emperor himself that was intended to ensure that humanity would still be able to combat the threat of chaos long after the Horus heresy had ended. Tallery found it difficult to bear the knowledge that chaos would continue to threaten mankind, even after the end of the Great Civil War that now engulfed the Imperium. To end her threat to the security of the project, Malkador ordered Garo to execute her and put her out of her misery. Now, while I am quite fond of the old man Malkador, he does have a questionable habit of being fairly trigger-happy when it came to keeping secrets. Naturally, Garo refused and rebelled against the sheer cruelty of the order against someone who was a proven servant of the Emperor. Malkador relented and came up with another solution that would make use of both Tallery's knowledge as well as her proven skills and adept. She was taken into the Sigilite's confidence concerning the true scope of the project on Titan and made the project curator Adepta Primus, the Imperial bureaucrat in charge of completing the new facilities on Titan. Now, Gero returned to Terra and once more took up his quest to find Keeler. In the course of his investigations, he discovered a remote site called Salvgardia, where a group of the Lacticio de Venatis, faithful, had been massacred by unknown assailants. Garo also met First Captain Sigismund of the Imperial Fist while going over the site, who revealed that he had encountered Keeler, who had also awoken his own growing belief in the divinity of the Emperor. 
In truth, Keeler was being hunted by the Vindicar assassin Aristide Kell, who had once been part of an executioner force sent by the assassin Clades to kill Horus on the world of Dagonet, early in the Horus heresy. Kell had survived the assault, but had eventually been taken captive by Horus. Kell proved to be easy to turn to the Warmaster's service. Kell had been returned by the traitors to Terra alongside the covert Alpha Legion's operative, Halm, in order to find and kill Keeler. Aware of Keeler's central role in the growing cult of the Emperor worship, the Warmaster hoped her death would unleash mass religious hysteria, further damaging Terra's stability as the traitor forces closed on the Soul system. It was the assassin and the Alpha Legion operative who had massacred the faithful at Salvagardia, where Keeler had been known to preach, and then tortured the survivors for information on the living saint's whereabouts. Eventually, both the traitor operatives and Nathaniel Garo managed to track Keeler to Terra's Hesperides orbital plate, where a group of Imperial worshippers were being held as prisoners for their violation of the Imperial truth. The traitor operatives infiltrated Keeler's group of the faithful, but when they moved to kill the living saint, Garo intervened, cutting Hall in half with his greatsword, Libertas, and then killing Kell before he could unleash the demon-possessed weapon Horus had given to him to carry out his task. Now, during the battle, Keeler continued to demonstrate miraculous powers, including the ability to share visions of the future, heal wounds, and stop time to communicate with others. To protect Keeler from any further attempts on her life, Garo handed her over to the custody of Malkador the Sigilite. Just before she was taken away by the knight errant Vardas, Ison, Keeler told Garo that his hand would free her when the time came. Keeler was placed within a prison below the Imperial Palace complex, where she was guarded by the troops of the Imperial Army Regiment known as Malkador's Own. She would be visited several times there by Garo in the years that followed, along with her old friend, the former itinerator, Kyril Sinderman, who somehow was able to regularly infiltrate the complex. The legend of Nathaniel Garo is vast and noble, but like all legends, there is an end, and Garo's end takes place on the Siege of Terra. Nathaniel Garo, alongside Helig Galor, rendezvoused with Euphrates Keller at the Marmax Bastion of the Imperial Palace. However, it was then that the Death Guard struck, with Mortarian and Typhus themselves leading the attack. In order to buy enough time for Keeler to escape with Galor, Garo went before the traitor host and personally parleyed with his fallen father. Garo rejected Mortarian's offer for a drink and to rejoin the Death Guard, and the two engaged in a furious duel. Mortarian initially held back in the hopes of humiliating Garo, but after sporting a wound, became enraged and quickly struck the loyalist warrior down. Mortarian then summoned a great host of flies, declaring they would take control of Garo's body and turn his corpse into the puppet to serve Nurgle for eternity as the Lord of Flies. Garo was spared this fate by Keeler, who empowered him with the Emperor's Light. Briefly reinvigorated, Garo furiously fought back Mortarian, but was still ultimately no match for the demon Primarch. Garo was impaled by Mortarian, and Libertas, Garo's mighty sword, was snapped in two. However, with one act of defiance, Garo further drove silence. Mortarian scythed into his body, took the broken stub of his sword, and stabbed it into Mortarian's neck. Garo inflicted a grievous wound on his gene father. Moments later, Garo died, accompanied by a vision of the Emperor. It was later said that Kyril Sinderman declared Garo as the first true martyr of the Church of the God Emperor. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Join us next week as we discuss possibly the worst human in all of history, Erebus. If you enjoyed this box, please like, follow, subscribe, and comment. Also feel free to check out our new shop where you can get some merchandise from the channel. Have a great day. And as always, <clears throat> until next time, this is Ekthar, signing off.